has spoken, worlds his mighty voice obey. Laws which never shall be broken and broken, for their guidance he hath made. He hath made. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Welcome to Twickenham. Thanks for coming out to be with, be with us this morning. There are 72 and a half churches on Whitesburg Drive, and you chose this one. So thank you. We are honored by that. You know, I call Whitesburg Drive the highway to heaven. If you can't get to heaven on Whitesburg Drive, you ain't going, all right? <laughs> hey, there is, a, there is a lot going on in our world, uh, in our church. And in our individual lives, lots going on. And a, a lot of it is awesome, and some of it's heartbreaking. And we're going to try to confront a lot of that this morning. So I'm going to tell you up front, the service is going to feel a little full. I'm not, I don't mean long, I mean full. There's just going to be a lot going on this morning as we think about all that's going on in our world. Let me start with one real positive note, though. Today, uh, yesterday, Wayne and Marion Jones spent, uh, celebrated their 63rd wedding anniversary. Would you guys stand up real quick, just wave. There we go. We're not, we're not sure. We think they're going to make it, okay? <laughs> Looking good so far, okay? So awesome. Congratulations, you two. Um, on Monday... Uh, an author named Eugene Peterson passed away. Uh, he's written a, a lot of books. Some of you may have read some of those books. If you've seen the translation of the Bible called The Message, he's the guy that did that. It's really a paraphrase of Scripture. I can't tell you it's the best translation out there, but he has made Scripture accessible for tens, 
hundreds of thousands of people by putting it in language people could really understand. So this morning, in honor of him, we are going to, all of our scripture readings and the message that I'll be preaching, uh, um, the scriptures I'll be using in the message come from Eugene Peterson's paraphrase of scripture, the message. So he's a good guy, and he's gone on to be with the Lord, and we celebrate that. All right, here's the thing. A lot of bad stuff is going on in our world right now, okay? But we are here, and we're going to praise the Lord because he is still sovereign. He is in control. He is the Lord of all. You think you're in the audience, but you're not. You're in the band. There's only one person in the audience, and that's the Lord. So stand up, band. You think you can sing. Maybe you can. You think maybe you can only carry a tune in a bucket or in the shower. When we all sing together, something beautiful happens, all right? So sing out to the Lord. Let's praise him in this place this morning. I can see the promised land. Though there's pain within the plan, there is victory in the end. Your love is my battle cry. When my fears like Jericho build their walls around my soul. When my heart is overthrown, your love is my battle cry, the anthem for all my life. Every giant will fall, the mountains will move, every chain of the past is broken into over fear, over lies. We're singing the truth that nothing is impossible. In the wars that rage inside, though the shadows steal the light, your love is my battle cry, the anthem for all my life. Every giant will fall, the mountains will move, every chain of the past you broke it into, over fear, over lies. We're singing the truth that nothing is impossible. Every giant will fall, the mountains will move. Every chain of the past you broke it in two. Over fear, over lies. We're singing the truth that nothing is impossible. Oh, nothing is impossible. Stand in faith. 
giving up. How could we? Even though on the outside, it often looks like things are falling apart on us. On the inside, where God is making new life, not a day goes by without His unfolding grace. These hard times are small potatoes compared to the coming good times, the lavish celebration prepared for us. There's far more here than meets the eye. The things we see now are here today, gone tomorrow. But the things we can't see now will last forever. One day you'll make everything new. Jesus, one day you will bind every wound.
One day we'll be free, free indeed. Jesus, one day all the struggle will cease. And we will see your glory revealed on that day. When we call. John chapter 3, Jesus has a conversation with a man named Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a Pharisee and a prominent leader among the Jews. In their discussion, Jesus states the following things in John chapter 3, verses 13 through 15. No one has ever gone up into the presence of God except the one who came down from that presence, the Son of Man. In the same way that Moses lifted the serpent in the desert, so people could have something to see and then believe, it is necessary for the Son of Man to be lifted up. And everyone who looks up to Him, trusting and expectant, will gain a real life, eternal life. Jesus references a situation in the Old Testament here in the book of Numbers. The Israelites have Egyptian slavery behind them. God is leading them to a land flowing with milk and honey. But the Israelites' tendency was to believe more in overwhelming circumstances of the moment rather than in the sovereign God that was guiding them. They were in their wilderness warning, in their wilderness wondering. They were being supplied by all their needs by God. They were witnessing the power of God, and yet they spurned the Lord's provisions and affections by grumbling. They became a patient, They accused God and Moses of treachery. They doubted God's character, and they doubted His Word. In response, God acts quickly to punish them by sending serpents into their midst. Now this would strike fear in the heart of any person. Suddenly, out of nowhere, poisonous serpents are crawling through the camp. They are biting, they are infecting, they are killing. The break in their trust of God by the Israelites was a serious offense. It was sin. Sin whose punishment here resulted in physical death for many. Israel was learning the tough lesson that sin leads to death real time. The people cried to Moses for help. The same Moses that they had just accused of treachery. Moses intercedes for Israel. And upon hearing this penitent plea, God provides a rescue from sin and death as a bronze serpent is placed up on a pole. And the people are asked to look at the serpent, and they will be healed. 
The word look here in Hebrew means to fix your gaze upon something and to look intently. To fix your gaze upon something and look intently. The idea is that the Israelites would have to concentrate their mind's attention and their heart's affection. They listen to the Lord's Word through Moses. They look at the bronze serpent, and as they look and as they gaze intently, they are healed. Doubtless, it was a mystery to them. It's a mystery to us. But God chose the symbol of their punishment for sin as the instrument of His mercy. After referencing this this, this numbers uh, event in John 3, Jesus then states that He also must be lifted up. When Moses lifted up the bronze serpent for the people to see, He was providing a remedy for all who look at it. Now Jesus is going to be lifted up. But it is going to have a much more broader reaching recovery. The bronze serpent's work was temporary. Jesus' work would be permanent. Christ was going to be lifted up on a cross as the payment for our sins. He was going to be exalted before the nation and everyone that looks at Him, gazing intently, will live, will recover, and will be made whole for eternity. We see this bronze serpent one more time in the Old Testament. It's in the book of 2 Kings chapter 18. Hezekiah is the king. He's one of the few good kings, and he is destroying the idols within the kingdom. One of the items that he finds is this bronze serpent that Moses had raised up in the desert. For all these years, Israel had kept it. At the time that Hezekiah took the throne, though, the Israelites were burning incense to it. It had become another idol. The item that God used in one generation as His instrument of deliverance has become the object of worship in another generation. The people had forgotten their true deliverer, and as we sometimes do, substituted an idol in His place. Jesus, as He planned to go to the cross, would not just become one more thing for the history books. His body hanging on the cross is not a relic for us to drag around or to consider lightly. With the bronze serpent, God provided temporary rescue from sin and death. That said, every Israelite who was healed by gazing at that bronze serpent eventually died. Jesus was interested in a greater goal. He wanted everyone to gain eternal life. And with the sacrifice of Jesus, God provided a permanent solution to sin and death for anyone that looks at Him. Jesus continues in John 3. This is how much God loved the world. He gave His Son. He gave His one and only Son. And this is why, so that no one need be destroyed, by believing in Him, anyone can have a whole and lasting life. God didn't go to all the trouble of sending His Son merely to point an accusing finger, telling the world how bad it was. He came to help to put the world right again. This morning as we take the Lord's Supper, let's look. Let's gaze intently at our Savior, lifted up on a cross knowing that no matter our sin, no matter our doubt, no matter our pain, God will bring recovery if we look at Christ and believe. Let's pray. God, thank you um, for Jesus' words to Nicodemus. Thank you for his willingness to go to the cross and to be lifted up. As we pause to take this bread, as we take this emblem of his broken body, help us to gaze intently at him on the cross. In Jesus' name, amen.
Pray with me. God, thank you for the rescue from sin and death that you provided at the cross. As we take this cup, as we remember the blood that was shed for us, help us to remember and may we celebrate the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. From my mother's womb, you have chosen me.
God, we thank you that we're your children. And that because you cared enough to die for us, we're free from fear. There's just nothing to fear. Not depression, not anger, not stress, not even death itself. And so we give you thanks. Thanks for the gift of courage and not having to be afraid. May we remember that as we give back this morning because of what you've done for us. And this is our prayer in Jesus' name, and all that agree with me say, amen. Let's take her off home. Blessed be your name in a land that is plentiful, where streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. Stand. Blessed be your name when the sun's shining down on me, when the world's all as it should be. Blessed be your name, blessed be your name on a road marked with suffering, though there's pain in the offering, blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. glorious name. You give and take away. You give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. You give and take away. You give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. You give and take away. You give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. You give and take away. You give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Hey. Amen. Be seated. So I want to start a little heavy. Yesterday, uh, 11 people at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh were killed. Six others wounded. I think there were four police officers who were wounded. Shortly um, after that began, uh, police arrested a gunman who had been posting anti-Semitic garbage online. And we'll see uh, 
what more is there, but we're glad that he's in custody and we mourned with the people and the families at Tree of Life Synagogue. They don't think the same thing about Jesus we do, but they are image bearers of God and their lives had value from the womb. And it didn't matter what their politics were or what they believed, they were important to God and loved by God. And the hard thing for me to say is that the guy that killed them is an image bearer of God too. He's broken. The image is deeply broken in him. But as we pray and think about that, we need to pray for him as well. And that comes on the heels of um, several pipe bombs that were mailed to a number of Democrat political leaders this past week. And that suspect has been arrested. So I want to say three things about that as we begin this morning. First of all, if you see a police officer in a restaurant by their meal, don't ask, just do it as a way of saying thank you because when the bullets start flying, those are the people who run toward them. And whatever you feel about how the police police, they have the most dangerous job in the country and we should be grateful and thank them for it. So when you see one, buy their meal. Second, it is way past time for hatred and violence to stop. And it is past time for us to stop blaming. It's time to stop blaming the other political party for it. If you want the tone of the conversation to change, change your tone. Especially on social media. Please, do not follow a post about how awesome Jesus is with a post about how awful uh, Pelosi or Trump are. James, the brother of Jesus, said, a good tree cannot bear both sweet and bitter fruit. Okay? So if the tone is going to change, it's going to start with me and with you. So as we speak with people, and especially as we interact online with people through Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or any of the other social platforms, we need to remember that the people to whom we are Facebooking or Instagramming or tweeting or Snapchatting or whatever we're using, the people to whom we are speaking and the people about whom we are speaking are made in the image of God. And, and our words need to be words that build up and encourage, not tear down and destroy. So be aware of that. Third thing, this is not new. None of this is new. Hatred and violence are old, but love and courage are older and stronger. I'll we'll tell you a story about a man named Casper. Casper Ten Boom. It's a name, isn't it? He was a watchmaker in Amsterdam, Netherlands, before and during World War II. He was also a devout Dutch Reformed Christian. When the Nazis invaded, he began, along with his, his, his family, especially his daughters, Betsy and Corey, he began to provide food and shelter to Jews. On February 28th, 1944, the Gestapo raided the Ten Boom home and they arrested Casper and his daughters, his son Willem, his grandson Peter. And then the Gestapo just stayed there in the house and the rest of that day when other supporters showed up to the Tin Boom home to, to help with their work, they too were arrested. In all, the Gestapo arrested about 30 different family members and friends at that home that day. When they interrogated him, the Nazis told Casper that they were going to let him go because he was old and they said, you're... You get to, you, we're just going to let you die in your own bed. And here's, here's what he said to them. And I love this. <laughs> this, is, this is so cool. He said, if you, if you release me today, tomorrow, if somebody knocks on my door looking for help, I will open it and I will give them help. 
And the Nazis said, you know, if you kill Jews, if you help Jews, you can be killed for that. And Casper said, it would be an honor to die for one of God's chosen people. Nine days later, he did die in a hospital. His daughters, however, were sent to Ravensbrück concentration camp. It was a women's labor camp in Germany. The barracks where Betsy and Corey Tinboom were housed were overcrowded and flea infested. But they managed to smuggle a Bible in. And then at night, they would read that Bible, uh, afraid that the Nazis would find it. Uh, and one night, they read Paul's letter to the Thessalonians. And they read the part in chapter 5 that, that we looked at a little bit last week, and again this morning we'll look at. Uh, it's, it goes like this, be cheerful no matter what. These are two girls in the concentration camp, and they're reading this. Be cheerful no matter what. Pray all the time. Thank God no matter what happens. This is the way God wants you who belong to Christ to live. Betsy told Corey, I think that means we need to thank God for the fleas. And Corey said, no. I cannot thank God for the fleas. But Betsy said, it says right there, thank God no matter what. And so Corey said, all right, we'll try it. And so they began to thank God for the fleas. And then they noticed a, a, a curious thing. They noticed that the Nazi guards never entered their barracks. That meant that the women were never assaulted. It also meant that they could hold open Bible and prayer meetings at night. And because of those Bible and prayer meetings that they held every night, dozens of women were brought to Jesus through those Bible studies. They learned later that the guards never came into their barracks because the guards didn't want to get bitten by fleas. Now, I don't know about you, but I, I hear a story like this, and I, and I have two reactions. One, I'm really convicted by that. I'm convicted because I, maybe I should be, but I'm not that far along in my faith. I, 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 rather than being, being thankful, I mean, I complain. I haven't had the occasion to complain about fleas, but I'm, I have complained about mosquitoes and the heat and then the cold and traffic and other drivers, especially other drivers. I've even complained about some of you. Some of you especially I've complained about. The, the other reason that I have, uh, uh, the other reaction that I have to, to this story and again, this may be not a good thing to say about me, but it's how long ago and far away it feels. This is the 1940s. This is Germany. People like Corey and Betsy and, and Casper Tinboom, it's almost like they're characters that a novelist wrote into a fiction. It, it's a great story. It, it just doesn't seem, doesn't feel real. In fact, it, 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 it's, in some ways, it's kind of like they're characters in the Bible. Long ago and far away. And they don't feel all that real. So every now and then, it helps me, and I hope it'll help you. If I talk to somebody that I can see with my own eyes and hear with my own ears, somebody that I know who can tell me about how they face hard times with courage and grace and even gratitude. So I've invited uh, one of our members to come and join us. Her name is Farah Rawlings. Farah, could you come on up, please? Let's give her a hand while she comes up here, please. I got a water for us, hang on. That's actually my seat. That's okay. <laughs> there you go. So, Farah, hi. How are you? I'm okay. Good deal. A little nervous. 
<laughs> Nervous? A little bit. This is way out of my comfort zone. Is it? It is. Okay, it's way out of their comfort zone too. So. <laughs> <laughs> At least some of them anyway. So. So, uh, a lot of people don't know you, okay? So let's okay. kind of start with the, some of the basics here. You're from Alabama. I am. Where, where were you born? Um, I was born in a little town called Utah, Alabama. U what, Utah? Yes, just south of Tuscaloosa. It's not the Utah with the snow ski? No, not that one. <laughs> okay. All right. And uh, tell us about who's in your family. Okay. Um, well, I have my husband, Wes, and our two girls, Allison and Olivia. Allison and Olivia. Yes. Okay. The girls, Olivia's a good kickball player. Saw her doing that the other That's night. That's what I so. hear. She is. How long have you guys been at Twickenham? Um, I have been at Twickenham since 2001, so 17 years. Okay. And you, now you, you weren't married when you came here, right? I was not. Okay, where'd you meet Wes? Um, we had uh, some mutual friends that set us up. Um, I met Emily through Brad way back when. Okay, Emily, you met Emily, Emily Bass, Bass through Brad, and, okay. Yes, right. and Emily has a twin sister named Kylie, and um, her husband and my husband, and Wes, grew up together, and so they, when they would come visit from Montgomery, Kylie called me one day, and she was like, hey, there's this guy that goes to church at, with the Nick's family, and I think you need to meet him, and so we did, and about... Nine months later, we got married. Yay. <laughs> yeah. So if you need a husband or a wife, Emily Bass, <laughs> we'll hook you up. Okay. I got to ask this, I, I ask this uh, of everybody in Alabama, because it's, it, it's important to know, War Eagle or Roll Tide? Roll Tide. Roll Tide, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so sometime um, back in, uh, I think it was 2016, you had a reason to go to a doctor. I did. Tell us about that. Um, in the summer um, of 2016, I found a lump in my left breast, and um, it didn't go away like the ones I'd had in the past. So um, I called my doctor, and she saw me that week, and they did an examination. They were um, based on the characteristics of the lump. She said, I don't think it's anything major, but we need to know what it is and what we need to do about it. So I need you to go have a mammogram and an ultrasound. And the soonest they could, that was like on a Tuesday or Wednesday, and the soonest they could get me in was like on Friday, which also happened to be my 39th birthday. Happy birthday. Yes. <laughs> so I go, and they had said I would not know anything that day, so I went by myself, just thinking it was going to be a quick in and out, and I could finish my day like I had planned. And so um, before I left the breast center, um, <clears throat> the radiologist wanted to speak with me, and so they brought me back into the radiologist's office, and he had my scans up on the screen. And he said, we would be very surprised if this wasn't something bad. Oh, so the radiologist, um, you're... At first, it was like, yes. this will be okay. Then it was like, yeah, not going to be so okay. So when the radiologist sees the images, he's like, this is not good. Um, you've got to come back on Monday for um, a biopsy. <clears throat> so um, after that, I don't know, punch in the gut, like I was just, I was shocked because I was not expecting that. Um, I kind of fell apart a little bit. Um, and they kept asking me, is there anybody with you? Is there anybody with you? And I'm like, no, it was just supposed to be a mammogram. <laughs> like, nobody is with me. It wasn't supposed um, to be a big deal. So you, No, it was yeah, not supposed right. to be a big deal. I wasn't supposed to find out anything that day. Um, but I kind of gathered myself together. And my, it was my birthday, so my driver's license had expired. And so I just <laughs> went on to the DMV and had my picture taken. So... <laughs> Can we, have, can we see that picture? Oh, it's down there somewhere. It's not very pretty. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So you, go, you get your driver's license yes. and then we go I through. just keep, yeah, then we do the biopsy and um, on Tuesday of that next week I got the official breast cancer diagnosis. Okay. 
And a double mastectomy followed. Yes, double mastectomy. Um, they removed some lymph nodes um, in the original surgery. Um, short time later, they, we found another lymph node that was, I don't know if it was one that was left behind or if it was one that just, it reappeared after. Um, so they took that one out. Um, and then we, we did chemo first. We did chemo first and then the surgery. And then um, they took that out. They, and I was not going to do radiation. Um, I have a genetic mutation that we think caused my cancer. And some of the research says radiation and that gene don't mix well. So we weren't going to do radiation. But when they found that other lymph node, my doctor was like, we really need to hit it with some radiation. Okay, so wife, <clears throat> mother, two daughters. Mm -hmm. Yes. Life's rocking along. Cancer, double mastectomy, chemo, radiation's a risk, but we got to do it anyway. Mm -hmm. So we get through all of that, and things are things are going okay, right? Right. Your thing, we feel like we're clear. Right. And then, um, in February of this year, I found out I had a brain tumor. Um, so they went in and took that out. Um, there were some complications. I had got an infection. Was in the hospital for about a week. Um, it was apparently a scarier time for my family and friends <laughs> than it was for me because I was just kind of out of it and <laughs> sleeping a lot. Um, that went away. Um, they ended up having to go back and do a second surgery to kind of fix, had a spinal fluid leak, so they had to fix that. Um, anyway, so they. And now this took week, that. this past week, then yes, we, we thought all that was done. We thought but all this that week, was done. But then this <clears throat> week, you went back to the I doctor. I got yes, I had had um, just a normal routine MRI just to verify that nothing was there, um, and there was something there. There's several spots um, all over my brain. Now, last week I asked a couple of weeks ago I asked Fair if she'd be willing to do this, so. Last Sunday, I said we were going to have somebody up here, and we didn't have that news last Sunday. This is brand new information that you just found out there are spots this week. Yeah. Okay, so here's the thing. There's that passage in First Thessalonians where, where Paul says, give thanks mm -hmm. no matter what. Right. How, how do you do that? Um, it's, it's not always easy. Uh, but after that, after that first freak out moment, um, I just made a choice that <clears throat> I could be bitter and I could blame God and be miserable, or I could um, rely on my faith and trust the things that I knew to be true, um, and just let God live through me. What, what, are the, what are the things you're grateful for? Um, I'm grateful for, grateful for my family, uh, for my friends, for the people that, I, that have just helped us along the way, um, from doctors and nurses. Um, you had a, an incident with a nurse last week, or a medical professional, or something. Yes, um, I went to have the mask made for, um, <clears throat> for radiation that starts this coming week, and uh, on the wall, there was a, a sign that says, Believe in Miracles. And she had a cross on her name badge. Okay. Um, so your sense is there's somebody, a person of faith, that's taking yes, care of you. Yes, okay. yes, um, And there has been, there have been nurses through the whole thing that have prayed for me, told me that they were praying for me. Um, even um, one of the nurse synthesis that put me to sleep, she was like, you're going to be okay. I'm praying for you. Um, just little things along the way that God used as reminders um, to continue to give him glory and, to, and give him praise. They may be small, but they're enough if you're mm -hmm. looking. Yes. Okay. Fairy, you are a hero in our church. I know you don't like to hear that. You don't feel that way about yourself. But I want your girls to know, and I want your husband to know, that when we see you, we see enormous strength. And we see in real life 
the kinds of things that we only hear about and read about in stories. So bless you for that. So I'm going to ask one of our elders, Lee Potts, to come on up. Lee and is going to say a prayer with us. And uh, why don't you just stand down here, and we can turn your mic off, okay? And we're going to let Lee pray. And if you want to come stand with Farah, and we'll just pray over her right here for just a minute, and then I'll have some more things I want to say in just a second. So. Church, you need to know that this is a holy time. Ecclesiastes 7 says it's better to go in the house of mourning than the house of feasting, for this is the end of all mankind, and the living will lay it to heart. There is very little to be thankful for in cancer, in Parkinson's disease, in dementia. But there is this. In those moments, God comes close and he reminds us of what really matters. So let's pray. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love to those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field, for the wind passes over it and is gone, and his place knows it no more. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him, and his righteousness to children's children to those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom rules over all. Bless the Lord, O you as angels, you mighty ones who do his word, obeying the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all his hosts and his ministers who do his will. Bless the Lord, all his works and all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. And Father, we pray that you would bless this woman who means so much to us. You know our hearts, Lord, and you know how earnestly we pray for healing. You know how desperately we pray that you would make your name known as mighty and great by wiping out every errant cell in her body and restoring her to full health. (laughs) But Lord, if that be not your will, then we stand with Job and we say, naked I came from the womb and naked shall I return. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lee. Okay, so how do we do this? How, how, do you, how do we maintain a joyful, grateful spirit? How do you do that when you're getting chemo and radiation every day for weeks on end? How do you thank God for fleas? Here's the good news. Paul doesn't just tell us to thank God no matter what and leave it at that. He tells us why we can do that, how we can do that. Because he says that God has solved two unsolvable problems, two problems that we could never solve. Here's what he says a few verses before he tells us to be thankful no matter what. This is uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 
beginning in verse 13. He says, and regarding the question, friends, that has come up about, uh, come up about what happens to those already dead and buried, we don't want you to be in the dark any longer. First off, you must not carry on over them like people who have nothing to look forward to, as if the grave were the last word. Since Jesus died and broke loose from the grave, God will most certainly bring back to life those who died in Jesus. I've read those words at hundreds of funerals, but they are not just words for the chapel or the cemetery. If you are following Jesus, listen, are you listening to me? If you are following Jesus, you can wake up every single day knowing that if this is your last day on earth, it's not your last day. You hear that? If you follow Jesus, you can wake up every single day and you can know that if this is my last day on earth, it's not my last day. Because God solved the problem of death. Problem solved. That's why we can be grateful no matter what. Now, for some of us, that may be a small comfort. The idea of resurrection, in fact, might be a little frightening because, like, God's a harsh judge, right? He's a hanging judge. And if we wake up from the first death only to face what the Bible fearsomely calls the second death, that doesn't sound all that good. Well, here's the good news God has solved that problem too. Because before he tells us to be thankful no matter what, he has just written that no one knows when Christ will return that, that there's going to be a great surprise. And then he says this in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, he says, but friends, you're not in the dark, so how could you be taken off guard by any of this, by the sudden coming of Christ back? He says, you're sons of the light, your daughters of the day, we live under wide open skies and we know where we stand. God did not set us up for an angry rejection, but for salvation by our master, Jesus Christ. He died for us a death that triggered life. So God solves the problem of death, but God also solves the problem of sin. The cross killed the power of sin. The empty tomb destroyed the power of death. And so since our two biggest problems have been handled, we can be grateful no matter what. And I mentioned earlier that um, we were reading from Eugene Peterson's paraphrase of the Bible, the message in honor of his passing. His family released a statement describing his last days. He passed away on Monday. Here's what his family said about his last days. Quote, during the previous days, it was apparent that he was navigating the thin and sacred space between earth and heaven. We overheard him speaking to people. We can only presume we're welcoming him into paradise. And there may have even been a time or two when he accessed his Pentecostal roots and spoke in tongues. Among his final words were, let's go. And my, his joy. My, oh my. The man remained joyful right up to his blessed end, smiling frequently. Here's the thing. I, I don't want to just die that way. I want to live that way. I want to I live with death-defying gratitude. I want to live with inexplicable joy. And I can, you can. We can face fleas or funerals and everything in between because God has handled sin and death through the cross and the empty tomb. So it doesn't matter what else happens. Because of that, Everything, everything else is going to be okay. Be grateful no matter what. Let's stand. Let's praise the Lord one more time. There is an endless song. 
echoes in my soul. I hear the music ring, and though the storms may come, I am holding on, and to the rock I cling. How can I keep from singing your praise? How can I ever say enough? How amazing is your love? How can I keep from shouting your name? I know I am loved by the King, and it makes my heart want to sing. Except for this morning when I have no voice. Be seated. The message is still true. Do you ever wonder why we're here? I hope this morning you're not wondering. This morning was full of everything that we should be about. Praise and honor and glory and blessing and thanksgiving and the sharing of the commonalities of the problems we face in the world as family together. But that's only half the equation. What happens here is only half the equation because the other half is what happens outside of here. And we got some things to talk about this morning about what happens outside of there before we get away because we told you it was going to be a full morning. Doug Herring. Doug. Oh. Doug has been on the PAR disaster relief trip. Turn that on. For the last, oh, it's on. Seven days, and I want to just ask Doug a couple questions and let him tell you some things while you see some of the stuff that's going on. Question one, Doug, you have been to every disaster I think that we have covered in the last since we started this, pretty much. So you've seen tornadoes and hurricanes. How does this one compare to the other things that you've witnessed? This one's a little bit different. Uh, if you remember Florence hit North Carolina and all, when we went there, almost exclusively the damage was flooding. So we're destroying houses, basically, at that point. With all the mold and stuff, you figure how high it is, and you cut everything out. It doesn't matter if it's cabinets, bathrooms, or whatever. This one was almost exclusive trees. And, of course, we get a lot of representation right here. You see, our trailer is the one there. And so a lot of people know who's there. Uh, the group is made up of multiple churches, we had uh, two from Twickenham at this one. We have five there now. Uh, but basically, we're removing trees from houses, uh, removing and then tarping the roofs that are destroyed, things of that nature. But the main thing we do is counsel and listen to the families. Our number one rule when we're out there is if a family person comes up or a member of the community comes, you drop whatever you're doing and spend time with them because they need that assurance and all that it's going to be okay. And them knowing we are representing churches and being the hands and feet of Christ, they're happy to see us and things go well. And we have another team that left today? They left yesterday, yesterday. morning at 7 o'clock. How they many actually, were in that group? You had 13? We had 10 in our group, and there's 14 in the group down there now. They actually are started. We actually scouted out, and they are actually working this morning on the first couple of houses. And this is going to go on for a long time? Yeah. We have multiple... Uh, Plans, it's always loosely planned because you never know what's going to happen next. Like I said, our plan originally was to go back to North Carolina multiple times. Then this hit. So we're going to keep going back, you think? There'll be more trips coming up in the future? More trips coming up. Uh, right now there's a tentative one planned to be there the 9th, the week of the 9th. Uh, there may be a smaller one that goes in between now and then. Uh, when's the first one? The next one gets back. Team 2 is there now. Are going to be back on Saturday. Is there anything that we can do to continue to support? One of the things that really helps, of course, what we can all do is we can all pray for the people there, the group safety that travel back and forth, and then uh, just the communities at large. You'd be amazed at what's going on down there. People homeless on the streets and things of that nature, not because they were homeless but before, but because they are now. I have a prime example, Dave Morrell. We were driving. Dave, stand up. I saw you. Dave, Dave's gone. Dave's oh, actually left. gone to serve communion at Mayfair Tower. That's right. For <laughs> so he's over at Mayfair Towers right now. But 
We were driving down the road, and Dave sees a couple just sitting on the front steps of a church eating a meal. And so he says, I just feel like we need to stop and talk to them. And it happened to be they lost their jobs because the hotel they worked at was destroyed. And so then they lost their house in the meantime. And so it's just a snowball thing. So it's more than just losing your home. These people have lost their jobs, their livelihood, and everything. So by what you all do, uh, we've had several people donate, and we give the funds directly to the people in forms of gift cards. That way it's specifically for a place and all, and hopefully they use it for the right thing. And so that has been a big help and a big blessing. Uh, you would be amazed. We, after every time we finish a job, we bring the group together. We have a prayer with the family and all while we're there. And then uh, if we've decided as a group it can help them, we'll give them Lowe's gift cards or a Sam's or Walmart gift card and all. And the people are just shocked and overwhelmed that people in North Alabama care enough about them to go even beyond getting the physical things taken care of as far as the house and all, but also the physical side of making sure they eat and can continue to get the repairs they need after we're gone. Hey, thank you guys for all of this, for everything that you do. And thank you guys for your support as this ministry continues. Thanks, Doug. We also, this weekend, had a men's retreat, and I gotta tell you what, fantastic. In fact, I'm gonna be on a campaign next year, guys. I'm gonna be after you to go to the men's retreat, because it was great. Jody was there. Jody, what was your favorite part? My favorite part was when I found out that one of our elders and one of our ministers stole a pumpkin and put it in a catapult and slung it across the camp. That's interesting, because my favorite part was the catapult. It's not really a catapult, it's a tebuchet? Trebuchet. Yeah, that one. Mm -hmm. It's French. We got to be in teams, every elder was a captain, and we got to, at this one station, this team building thing, we got to build a catapult. There was a pile of lumber and a box of two. In fact, have we got... Oh, come on. <laughs> Look, watch this. That's one of the catapults that we built. And see, it slings a tennis ball. It's really cool. And look... Oh, wait, there's a guy out in the back. Who is that? <laughs> I hate you. Who's, who's that guy? What's he going to do? Boy, he's really slow. <laughs> That's a slow video, Mike. Oh, there it is. He's got it. He's got it. Oh, he dropped it. Looks just like an Auburn receiver, doesn't he? <laughs> and we're out of time, folks. I got something for you. What do you got? Second harvest is coming up. You, if you can't help... Go down to PAR and help people in Panama City in a couple of weeks. You had a bolt, you know, this is in your bulletin today, right? You can help bag groceries. And folks, there are people that are hurting in Panama City. There are people that are hurting in Huntsville too, and they need our help. So next couple of weeks, you're going to see these, these grocery bags show up. Read this, find out how you can help, be a part of that, and it would be awesome. Last thing, and we don't have time for the video, I'm just going to tell you about it. This Wednesday night is Trunk or Treat. Bunch of kids are going to be coming to our parking lot. It's Halloween night, all right? I'm going to be there with my truck decorated. We need candy and we need you. We need you here at 530 to greet folks and welcome them. We're going to have chili. Be a, uh, I need you to be the hosts, to welcome these folks to be a part, of our, uh, a part of our community. Enjoy the chili. Bring candy, bring candy, bring candy. Set your car up, put candy in the trunk. If you We're going to have a catapult that's going to... Throw candy. children across the, the parking lot. Across so. the parking lot. Oh, and you forgot one. What? Friday night's the annual day of prayer. Annual day of prayer, Cards Friday night. filled so. out and turned back in, and we'll have a great time Friday night at our all-night prayer service. Let's stand together, and we will close in prayer. Jim, lead us in prayer. Thanks for being here. Father in heaven, we thank you for being here in our midst today. As we studied in our Sunday school class about you, allowing Peter to heal the lame man through the name of your son. We pray that you would heal Pharaoh through the name of your son also. We pray you'll be with us all this week. Help us to do everything that we do the best we can and help us to dedicate it as a worship to you. We thank you for your son and all he went through for us. 
We thank you for his blood that cleanses us from our sins and gives us back into a relationship with you. It's in his name we pray. Amen.